Good evening and welcome to the latest installment of Build, Building the Scottish State. I have again with me uh, Mr. David Henry uh, and we've got a few things, that, exciting things to talk about on this uh, show and some other more uh, dramatic stuff uh, at the end. So first of all, Dave, thanks again for, for being with us. Thanks for inviting me back on. Okay. Well, first of all, let's just talk about this project that we've been working on basically since uh, February or March. And we started uh, with uh, several other about maybe, you know, maybe about eight or nine of us usually. Uh, we meet uh, every Saturday night and, uh, uh, you know, we, we started, we started meeting and we developed, uh, first of all, we, we, de we developed the, uh, um, the manifesto for Indy. And then we wanted to we we seek to formalize ourselves more in the uh, Scottish Sovereignty Research Group, and we're uh, we're still um, you know we're, we're developing the website. We hope to have something presentable within the next couple of weeks or so. But what what are I know that you'll agree with this observation that uh, while th whenever there is another referendum, it's pretty clear that the work has the groundwork has not been done, and we've gotten the this agreement. Kenny McCaskill said the same thing. Uh, Jim Sillers has said the same thing, and that uh, and that uh, and Kenny McCaskill was making the point of uh, in when I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, he was saying you know even if there is a referendum called and they they chap on the doors, uh, you know what about the current I don't know. What about Europe? I don't know. What about EFTA? I don't know. And so there's no substance behind it. And so what we want to do is to bring together uh, the, the experts that we have who have worked really, really well together. It's one of the coolest things we've, I think I've ever done at least. And, um, and I think, and, and we've really gotten some good, you know, policy proposals together. I contacted the, the European Free Trade Association we, uh, and, and asked about membership. We've contact, we've got connections in Switzerland. We have connections in uh, Norway who have given us information about, uh, about, uh, about international recognition and possible membership in EFTA. So, you know, we've, we've already made some waves, but uh, we, and we certainly want to keep, uh, keep developing so that we can bring together you know, what about monetary policy? What about this? And, you know, all of these big, big questions that just have no answers and certainly not from the SNP at this point. So is that, uh, how do you, what would you like to add to that about what we, what we're well, you, you missed, you missed out um, Iceland, of course. Cause oh, excuse me. You can't, yes. can't forget how Iceland got brought up and <laughs> left us all in um, state of shock when, what was it, the, one of our members uh, yeah. commented about our first draft that we published saying they didn't like the reference to the EU, ref, uh, EU continuity bill and it was confusing people and uh, it obviously it needed to be explained that that didn't mean we were automatically joining the EU, which I believe is the SNP's policy, although they don't have a plan of how to achieve it. Yeah. Um, uh, and obviously we were going down the route of EFTA first then the EEA. But I do remember that particular night when uh, I questioned that chap and said, uh, who are these people that you're speaking to that don't like the EU mentioned? And then he said, well, it's the president of Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh, right. OK, I thought it was some, some idiot that didn't know what they were talking about. But um, <laughs> uh, and obviously we then did another draft version after we got more. Um, exit. I tell you what, the one thing I found about uh, the group that's come together for Manifesto for Indy. Apart from it gets us away from thinking of party politics, which I think is a healthy, healthy thing. I think that's been part of the problem. Because we have we have members from Alba, we've had members from Alba, we've had members from the SNP, you know, uh, both of them very prominent members of each. So we're really trying to bring together. We're not we no party conflict at all. We're, we're, it's it's non-partisan, yeah. and I just wish more of the Yes movement was non-partisan. My biggest. Um, criticism if I've got one of the yes groups is far too many of them are linked to one particular party and when for instance ISP came up and then there was the, the talk of AFI and obviously we knew about ALBA brewing away but we didn't know exactly when that was going to happen um, we wanted to get parties to adopt our manifesto for India as a principle and we tried to get the SMP obviously to do the same um, because uh, forget party politics. Scotland's future is far too important to be left in the hands of politicians. And that is actually, I think, the problem. Politicians, first of all, think of their own careers and have their own day-to-day -day issues to deal with and their own internal party politics. Um, whereas Scotland's future and Scotland's independence has really got nothing to do with any political party. It's about Scotland's independence 
And after you're independent, then you can vote for whoever, what party you want and argue for whatever you want. But uh, I, I think that's been the issue is that it's been tied up, linked to one particular party, which, of course, I was uh, a member of it until very recently. And but I only joined them to support independence. That was the reason I, I joined them. That's what they were claiming to offer. And here we are seven years later and there's nothing in sight. There's nothing on the horizon. There's been no work. He said there's not been no work. And that's true when it comes to the SNP, for instance, because I know that there has been no work uh, of any substance, unlike in the run up to 2014, where they produced, I think I've got it there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 600 page, um, too much detail, probably, I think. Because I think uh, what member of the public got time to read a 600 page book to work out what the part, what's going to be like after you're independent. But I think there has been some work done, but it's just not from a certain party. Mm -hmm. It's from uh, different groups, such as the finance group, you know, the currency group, our own, the manifesto. Um, and we do. Common we all the constant John Drummond's constant. Yeah, common, common wheel done work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where our new. Uh, SSRG is moving. It's bringing all the different elements together um, and, and presenting them in a coherent fashion and effectively driving driving this forward. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. That's the sound for you. But yeah, so I think I think we're it's not all lost, and perhaps what we all needed in the Yes movement is a boot up the bum uh, and told to go out there and, and deliver your own independence and stop wait for somebody else to do it for you. So I, I think maybe there's a positive thing that comes out of this, okay. although it would be nice to get the money back. <laughs> uh, and we'll get. Um, and I see a question from uh, from Aileen regarding that. We'll get to we'll get to the money at the end of the, at the in the last section of the program. Um, uh, but let's see. So um, and let, let's talk a little bit more about the manifesto for Indy and what what we had done initially. Uh, was that we we produced the document which basically said that if there were and this was hoping that uh, Alba would be embraced rather than shunned as as a method to uh, you know get a, a super majority uh, but obviously it wasn't but but it was that the that the different parties would adopt the uh, manifesto for Indy basically making a pleb plebiscite election whereby if if there was a majority in favor of independence that would signify that the the, the scotland had declared the scottish government had declared the sovereignty of the scottish people and that that and that they would uh, and they would lend that sovereignty to the government to you know have have jurisdiction or power over all of scottish land and um you know and, and territorial waters etc uh, and we 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 put out you know several a, you know a, a, a several point plan of what we do you know we seek mm. recognition we develop a constitution we, you know all of these things now obviously the uh, the the um, the uh, parties didn't adopt it with well, the ISP did and Ala, uh, Alba um, uh, in their manifesto they had at least three elements. Uh, that came directly. Yeah, I from think it was about. I think it was four. Four of our key elements. Well, I know that written adopted in Alba's manifesto. Yeah, written constitution, EFTA, EEA. Uh, yeah, Nordic was another one. Nordic Council, and I don't know what the fourth one is. Don't know. It might have been pensions. But I'm okay. not sure. So it's probably the only thing the SMP and Alba agree on is that the pension should be higher. <laughs> and so we. Uh, we've updated it. I didn't play a huge role in that, but can you explain? Yeah, I've got it here. I've got the update here, and I have to say I didn't play a big role. I think my input was, can we please put uh, the version of it at the very bottom and page numbers, please? Because otherwise, when you print them out, if you've got a printer like mine that managed to spit it out, they fall on the floor, and then you wonder which page goes where. So that's, I think that is mainly the only real thing that changed. Um I think I think what's important is to pose the questions and not be afraid of asking the questions. And I, I fear that's what the political parties have done. They've shied away from the important questions. And the important questions to me appear to be, what is our trading relationship with the EU from now on? If, if ever there was a great example of how not to do it, it's been Brexit. Um, the next thing is currency, of course. It's extremely important. Um, then there's the things like uh, pensions and that, but also borders. How does the border with England work? Um, you can't shy away that if England and the rest of the UK is going down or lowering standards in food and importing hormone injected beef, beef, et cetera, which incidentally, that is what their Australian deal 
allows to happen. So yeah. we're going to get lots of cheap garbage from somewhere else in the world, while our high on quality the other, on the other side of the world, literally. Well, literally the other. I mean, how do they get it here? I wonder how they get it here before it goes off. It's obviously not in a ship. If it was in a ship, it would be off by the time it got here. It'd be about three, four, five weeks later before it arrived. So they must be flying it here or freezing it or whatever. Um, but this is a this is a terrible deal. It's exactly what I learned four or five years ago at a SMP conference in Aberdeen. Uh, I don't know if any people out there watching might know, but you go to these conferences and sometimes the most interesting thing isn't the speeches by the the good and the great, but in fact, it's the fringe events you go to either at lunchtime or at the end of the day. And I went to a fringe event in Aberdeen and it was about farming. Uh, and I think it was 2016, because I think they had voted for Brexit. I'm pretty certain it was that. I might be wrong. It might have been before that. Anyway, the chap on that board, on that panel, start, he, was a, he was the vice president of the National Union for Farmers, I remember, rightly. He was dead against the EU, dead against their subsidies, the 20% subsidy that farmers get for producing certain products. So he said farms should be able to produce their own food without it, and it's costing us more, and it's a fortress. And Well, yes, he was right on one point. It is a fortress. Uh, it's a locked market which stops cheap, uh, lower quality products getting into the marketplace, i.e. from outside the EU. Um, so he was right on that point. And I asked a question there. At first I said, oh, I thought all my food came from Asda. And they all laughed because it was a room full of farmers. And they obviously all thought, oh, here's this idiot from the city. Um, and I said, yes, but it appears to me that the EU brought in these subsidies, you know, the common um, market, uh, was to make sure that, the, that we didn't run out of food and that farmers didn't go after cash crops because otherwise you'd have all sugar cane one year and all of whatever, whatever was the most valuable crop and then the next year. And you'd, have, you'd end up with lots of shortages. So what, what the European uh, market is about is trying to ensure that there's always apples, there's always potatoes, there's always carrots, there's always meat, there's fish, there's grains. It's all produced because the farmer gets paid um, a subsidy for producing it. Milk, butter, all that. You'll remember them going on about the, the butter mountains and stuff. And while it's not perfect, it certainly isn't perfect, um, it's meant we've never had food shortages since the Second World War finished. That was the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. When I explain, so basically you're saying take away the, 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 the subsidy and just let farmers go after what? The most economically uh, rewarding crops. Well, then you're going to get one year, one crop, next year, something else, next year, something else. You're going to end up with shortages. And he had to basically agree. He hadn't thought it through like that. And it then dawned on me that what they were talking about with Brexit, which is what has happened, this is what we're living through now, is Scottish producers um, are now frozen out of their largest single market on their doorstep, the EU, while foreign producers outside of the EU now have free reign and access to the British market, including the Scottish market, because we've got no control over it. So the farmer is going to find it very difficult to sell their product, um, which is usually a high value product, you know, fish, salmon, things like that, beef, um, because we're going to get flooded with cheap mass produced rubbish from somewhere else. So we're, it's called a double whammy. That's the Brexit dividend. Yes. Farmers go out of business, you get cheap, horrible products with hormones and chlorine and in it from somewhere else on your supermarkets. The supermarkets will buy it from where, wherever's cheapest. That's what Brexit means. And if ever there was a lesson, which is that um, we should have stayed where we were. Scotland voted overwhelmingly, 62%, to remain in the EU. And yet we're not in it now. Just following on that um, from Stephen, uh, do we not have EU standards set in Scots law? So surely cheap imports won't be allowed here. Nope, uh, no. we're part of the U part of the UK, and this is being a huge uh, deal over in Ireland because they're having a huge confrontation over the over the uh, the, the Boris Protocol uh, yep. that negotiated after the backstop. The backstop would have. A lot, uh, would have had the uh, all of the EU, uh, the UK remaining in the customs union up until the point where a better arrangement would be 
found. But the but the Brexiteers said, no, 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 we don't want that because we want to, we want we specifically we want to diverge from the standards. We want to have sovereignty over our rules so that we can basically assign trade deals with Australia on the other side of the planet and get really cheap, you know, uh, you know, mega mega production, you know, cows and stuff like that, uh, for much cheaper, hormone treated. They don't have the same standards at all. Uh, do you, yeah. Do you know, there was one thing I watched about, it's about McDonald's and the difference between McDonald's fries in the US and McDonald's fries here in the UK. And in the US, there was about 200 ingredients in it. It was unbelievable. They had a, a yellow coloring thing to make it look more appetizing. Uh, all these dioxins and flavor enhancers and all sorts of, I mean, just unbelievable. You looked at it and thought, but oh, that's not even, why isn't it just made out of potato? I yeah. thought chips were made out of potatoes. No, well, they, they, oh, they, no, no. No, no, they make it to be addictive. They, I mean, they spend, you know, you know, they, they, you have all these chemistry tests. They have all these, you know, people eating it, and they, and it's because American food is designed to be addictive. So the people get, you know, eat it, they crave it, and they eat, you know, much more. Yeah. And, and then they crazy. crave it again. I know, and it's just garbage. I remember, you know, sometimes going in, you know, uh, late at night after a couple beers, and you know, eating like five hamburgers at the time, or you know, I mean, just because it's you, you, you just crave it, and then you feel sick afterwards. But there's that craving of it. That, I remember and, seeing and, someone. And they, yeah, exactly. I remember seeing someone standing in the queue at I think it was a Wendy's, which is like McDonald's, um, in Los Angeles near the airport. I was coming back from Los Angeles. And I'm standing there watching this person. They'd obviously had lots of plastic surgery and liposuction, and they were extremely skinny, mm -hmm. but didn't look at all healthy. Like, I mean, it just looked freakish. And there they are buying <laughs> burgers and fries. And these burgers were like like double the size we get and triple high, and 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 there's loads of melting cheese all over it. And I thought, my God, how many calories are in that? And then I'm looking at the person that's buying it. I thought, so you pay to shove it all in this end and then you go to a doctor and have it all extracted. It was just crazy. But yeah, that's, that's, I'm afraid, I mean, there you go. There's a perfect example. Somebody's asked the question. The answer is no. We have no control in Scotland over anything like that. The internal market bill destroyed devolution. It means they can do whatever they like just about anywhere. They can decide to invest money in our railways or take money out of the railways or or uh, they can change the food uh, standards and there's nothing Scot Scotland can do about it. We can moan about it, we can make speeches about it, but we can't stop it. Unless a, we're an independent country and then we're in control of our own standards. Um, hence why the Scottish government did try to bring in the EU continuity bill, which meant the standards in Scotland would stay aligned and in line with the European standards, meaning we could probably export into the EU. But as the more the UK moves away from the EU regulations, the more difficult it is to sell products into the EU. And that's apart from all the customs nonsense that you now have to deal with. So, yeah, we're um, being dragged away. It's going to damage Scottish farming because a lot of our exports did go into the single market. So I wonder what our government is going to do about it. And what do you, what, and let's, talk, let's go back to the manifesto for Indy. I mean, we have put forward a proposition that if they employed, they could. And so the, the whole idea is that simply the, the Scottish parliament has a vote. It, it, it could have been a big majority. It could still be a majority uh, asserting, again, asserting sovereignty and then starting, uh, you know, seeking international recognition, explaining the situation. Uh, and that's the, that's the kind of groundwork that just hasn't been done, at least to, at least to our knowledge. Uh, I, you know, I, I, in our group, we discussed this with the experts that have joined us as well. Um, and I thought, interestingly, that the first step of delivering Scotland out of this Brexit disaster is for the Scottish government to apply to the Nordic Council. Uh, you know, I think, I think it also is a signpost, a stake in the ground of their intention and their direction. But that's up to them to make that decision. And that takes a bold leader that, uh, I mean, let's face it, the leadership has nothing to lose because First Minister has been re-elected. They've got a majority along with the Greens. It could have been completely different, of course, if they had put out the welcome hand to and pushed the second vote to Alba, 
then they would have been looking at a majority of something like 90 MSPs, you know, and if they had all got to get their heads together and agreed on, and that was, of course, our plan, what we tried to get them all to do was manifesto for Indy, get all the parties that want to support an independent Scotland to agree on some key principles so that the statement was there in black and white, so that everybody that voted for them knew they were voting for that statement. Then we'd be in a very different position now, which is what we said, that you can start being independent on the 7th of November, uh, 7th of May. Yeah. You know, yeah. negotiations begin straight away. And instead, we had party politics with both votes this party and both votes that party. And the result is they've squandered what could have been a very different outcome. So where we go from now, I mean, Manifesto for India is still very much alive, which is great to see. Um, it's still a good, it's still full of good principles and good first steps. And the politicians must start listening because it's other people that are doing the work that they should have been doing in the last seven years. And it could not be more urgent. I mean, I, I, you know, when I when I see certain politicians just, uh, you know, yelling at Boris Johnson, you know, about all these terrible things they're doing. Well, what are you going to do? You know, we'll do something. I mean, don't just don't just yeah. shriek about it. I mean, get, you know, get out there and, you know, figure out how to how to get out of there. You know, I mean, it's uh, I mean, again, I mean, with, with all this stuff impending, I mean, uh, you know, and, and we, you know, the Scotland could have been, you know, asking EFTA and they still can. All they have to do is just say, look, we're, we're, we're sovereign and start negotiating and just, you know, start. I, yeah. up, you know, I mean, so that, that, that's a bit of like, I mean, my view of it is that they're only in a union with Mes Westminster because they agree to be in it. You know, the, the, the act of union has been broken by the UK government very clearly twice with Brexit. They broke it. They went against the will of the Scottish people and they decided to overrule them. There's no such thing as the British people. There never was. There's four nations, you know. Uh, two of the nations have got a football match tomorrow. Yeah. How come they've got how come they have a football team? Sorry. Um, so how come they've got a football team if there's no if they're not a, if they're not a nation? Of course they're a nation. So it's we're only in a union because the Scottish government agrees to be in it. Um, now, you're not going to get a majority of people in Scotland. And of course, the, no, the people that vote no and think it's better to be in the UK because they're afraid of the unknown. Well, you have to explain what the unknown is and explain all the opportunities, because um, I've already noticed, I don't know if you have, um, well, if you're in France, of course, but people here in, the UK, in Scotland have probably already noticed I usually do my shopping in an Asda and prices of certain things have gone up and up and up since January. What's what specifically? Oh, co cold meat. There's packs of cold meat. It used to be 165 and then it's gone up to 185 Now two pounds. Mm -hmm. That's quite, that's quite a percentage increase. Ooh. Yeah. It's 15, 18% increase in price since January. Wine is more expensive than it used to be. You know, there's none of the bargains that there used to be. The range has dropped quite dramatically. There's about a third of them that aren't there anymore. Um, I've, I've seen that on many products. Products go off the shelf and aren't there for about two weeks. That never used to happen. So I suspect that's all linked to the Brexit nightmare of getting things in and out of the country and all these trucks having to be checked. Um, so the damage of Brexit has already begun. Uh, well, soon, by the end of the year, we'll have seen that price, the average price inflation will have started going up. We're going to see job losses in farming and products, etc., as we lose business. Um, and yet we voted to remain in the EU. That was ignored. And the second reason why I think the Scottish government should think very carefully and urgently um, is the internal market bill. The internal market bill imposes English laws in Scotland. That's not allowed under the Act of Union. So the Act of Union is over, it's finished, they broke it. Okay, let's start negotiating our future relationship. We're out, we're finished. Nobody, hardly, hardly any country, that's what we've learned in our group, as you know, Mark, um, hardly any country gets independence by holding a referendum with permission from its neighbour uh, to get permission to leave them. Yes. And in fact, 
<laughs> under international law. And in fact, what uh, what the British uh, the well uh, the British argued in the Kosovo case was that the, was that uh, declarations of independence were definitely legal under international law, and the laws of the um, of the uh, of the um, the primary state, or you know, uh, yeah. uh, or, or the, the, the um, sorry, the uh, uh, the secession, uh, the, su su uh, the successor state cannot be bound by the laws of the um, yeah. original state. I know what you mean. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we shouldn't be playing the game of oh well, we need permission. Oh, we'll ask for section thirty. Section thirty is a trap, a legal trap. If you if you get one, and then of course this brings us, us nicely around to the, where is the money? to hold uh, your, your indie ref too. Where is the money that was raised um, in two, since 2017 and so-called ring-fenced? It's nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not, you want to it's not, in the account, not in the bank. So where is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I boil this down to something really simple. Would you trust somebody, if you were an employer, who, who had been at your till and taking money out the till to put it in their back pocket, but put a little note of paper in saying, I've just borrowed it. I'll pay it back when you need it, and put it back. Would you? Would you? Would you trust them? With no, you'd fire them. That's what you'd do. Fire them. You might report them to the police for stealing. Um, this is what it is, but on a grand scale, all the money's interwoven in the accounts. Really, is it? Which accounts are they? Where is it? Mm. It's not there. It's gone. You've so you've spent it. Just own up and be honest. You spent it on other things even though you promised people it was ring-fenced. Okay. It wasn't ring-fenced. Ring-fenced means you don't spend it on anything else. But before we get on to that, before we get more on to that, uh, just let's see, is there going to be a resolution at the ALBA conference to adopt the manifesto for India's ALBA po policy? Um, the, 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 that I would don't be... know. I don't know. I'm not a member of the ALBA party, <laughs> so I can't yeah. speak uh, about them or, or for them. Uh, I tell you what I'm impressed with about the ALBA party so far. It's the way the SNP used to be. They don't seem to be afraid to have debate, even if they disagree with each other on certain things. They seem to be open to having a debate about policy. Um, I was pleased to see that they had, even before the election, they had a women's conference. The SNP hasn't even had a spring conference yet. Um, I believe they, that- Are they supposed to? I mean, I know under, under yeah, the- Yeah, well, they, uh, they usually do. But the, and it was going to be right after the election, I was told, and there's no sign of it. So, um, and the last, the last uh, one that the SNP held was in November, and to be perfectly honest, it was a complete farce. Mm. There was no proper um, debate allowed. Uh, it was all controlled and contrived. Um, of course, I had written uh, on behalf of my branch and shared it with lots of branches and got lots of them to support it. And I wrote to Peter Marlin on the 2nd of November, asking him to make sure it went, to, because I believed it was very important. It was a transparency resolution. And it meant it would be more transparent, accountable, et cetera. And we would change some of the rules in the constitution to sharpen it up and make sure everybody stuck by the rules. And it never got to conference. In fact, none of the resolutions written by lots of smart people all over the country from different branches, from I think the Isle of Skye, uh, to Perthshire, Aberdeenshire, the, I saw many really interesting resolutions, one for a proper, more like human uh, resources complaints procedure with proper processes written down clear. No, not allowed to get to conference. None of it was allowed, including my transparency thing. I'll tell you what, if there was the transparency resolution was in place, they, would, they wouldn't have been allowed to take the money and use it for some other purpose. It would have been... First, the other thing is, it's not even good enough, the excuses they've come out with and the reasons. They've said, oh, it's, it will be, every penny will, has been accounted for and will be used. Well, it can't be used because you've spent it. So what you're actually saying is you're going to take money from somewhere else and put it back. It's back to the somebody with their hand in the till, borrowing one night and saying, it's all right, I need to go out in the town. I'll just use this money. And then next day, Putin going and putting the money back, hoping no one notices. That's what that is. You know, mm -hmm. it's interwoven in the account. I must remember that if anyone um, ever wants to steal from their boss. Just mention, use that as an excuse. Oh, it's interwoven in all the bank accounts. Well, whose bank accounts? Your personal one or the company's one? I mean, it's just nonsense, total nonsense. It's meaningless. Um, 
and the damage it's done to people's trust. Who's going to who's going to give them money now for another NDRF? Uh, that's probably why they're not having a conference this year. Well, I mean, conference used to make money. I believe it used to be, it used to be a big deal. I went to all of them, mm -hmm. and it's quite expensive to go to. I, right. I used I used to argue that this was uh, exclusionary to certain people. You know, I mean, if there was uh, apart from we had I remember members that were married uh, with kids, and for them to get away uh, and somehow have someone look after the kids because the husband works and and they're mainly at home looking after the kids. How are they going to go to com conference? Mm -hmm. So I said we should have things like creches, et cetera, for the kids to go to and, you know, and uh, the party should think about paying the fees for these um, delegate fees, because the delegate fees are about 35 pounds a person now. Uh, that's just to go to it. Then there's your accommodation, then there's your travel. So you can- uh, and, your member and your membership as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, um, it excludes people from lower wage brackets. It excludes certain folk. And that's what I love. I hear people going on about they want equality. Yeah. Well, start dealing with things like that. You might start delivering equality because that's where the problems are. It's not the fact that a woman isn't on a, a list to become a candidate. That's not where the problem is. The problem is, is many women uh, are excluded from even getting involved in politics because they're stuck at home or they're not earning enough money and they can't afford to take the time off from their job. Uh, that's equality. And that's where the problems are. It, they seem to think it's all oh, oh, men excluding women from the list. It's got nothing to do with that. It's This is um, problems in society and that we don't, it's not equal and it's not uh, balanced. Um, but <laughs> I digress a bit, but that's where the equality issues are. They're certainly not fixed by rigging lists of candidates. Um, that doesn't fix where the problem is. Mm -hmm in my view. Okay. Uh, going back, going back to Alba, um, the, 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 uh, sorry. Um, well, uh, I, I gave my second vote to Alba, uh, and Alex, uh, but Alex should have started a year before, not six weeks before an election. Alba had no TV time to get the message across. True. However, Alex Salmon was dealing with, uh, you know, the court cases. Also, uh, Alex did not start Alba. He, it was started by, you probably know who, Started it. Laurie I, Finn, Laurie Finn, and, and I don't know, can't remember the other person. I think they yeah. set up Alba. Yeah, and they started, I, I guess they must have, I don't know exactly when they did that, but Alex came on board relatively late. Uh, you know, he was asked by several uh, parties to, 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 you know, to be a member and to, and to kind of, you know, lead it. Uh, but, but, and he was asked by a manifesto for Indy, was asked for Alba yeah. and, and the other Alliance for Indy or whatever it was. Uh, but he, you know, he, he, uh, he, he, so it wasn't he that started the party. Uh, he was dealing all with his court stuff. And if he had, and if he had done that, if he had announced, you know, a new party a year ago, it would have been very, very complicated. He had to get all that stuff over with before he could announce it. Uh, and, and he, yes, he only had six weeks and it wasn't, and, and you're right about the TV, but they were, they were completely excluded from the TV. Uh, a good example was um, last, last time round, you had, uh, uh, that uh, that uh, that Coburn guy from uh, UKIP that was that had no, you know no no politicians at all and he was on the leaders debates for the Scottish Parliament uh, even though Alex Salmond is known as he is and they had two, two MPs they had you know several councillors but they couldn't they they couldn't get on be, uh, because they were you know they were deliberate it, it certainly doesn't look like it was a fair fight does it yeah um, but the problem is. Uh, I think Alex was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. You know, we we discuss this. We 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 uh, at the manifesto for India, our aim was always to get as many parties as possible to sign up to it. So we were non-partisan, and the first one was um, ISP. And I was very impressed with Colette and Julie how they set it up, and it was very professional. Um, and however, they were getting they themselves were getting virtually no media coverage at all. They were luckily if they were mentioned at all. Um, and I do think uh, broadcasters have a, a duty to be impartial, fair and balanced, and they shouldn't be prejudging the outcome of an election. So I would have thought that they, they both STV and BBC made a big mistake, which is that they, if you like, predetermined the outcome and therefore they're not important, therefore we won't have them on. Therefore that nobody knows about them, therefore no one votes for them, therefore they were right. I mean, it's a, it's a catch-22 and self-fulfilling. Uh, going forward, 
I think Alba is probably here to stay. I don't think it's a flash in the pan at all. Uh, I think if it has a good conference and uh, I, I think more and more people will join it. Um, the yes movement needs to cut its ties from certain political parties and force the issue. Bring, come together, work on independence, agree on the one or two things that you all agree on um, and force the politicians to play your tune, not the other way around. That I think that's in what's with, needed. That disobedience to get the SNP to move on independence. And if you do, what type of, what, what, what form might that civil disobedience take? Well, I think uh, people, I mean, peaceful protest is perfectly legal. You know, freedom of expression, peaceful protest is what's needed. However, I would say um, you don't even need to do that. What we, what our group is doing with the Scottish uh, Sovereignty Research Group, which is was the manifesto for Indy, we've continued to work and in slowly expanding our group, slowly expanding. And we're linking with other groups and we'll be publishing uh, papers and policies and directions. Uh, then I think it's our job to influence the politicians and tell them what we want. I mean, if you want to get their attention, any party's attention, stop funding them. If you stop funding them, all of a sudden they get the message uh, and don't vote for them. Uh, and then they get the message loud and clear. Uh, that is how politics works. You know, the problem is you're not going to get much of a, uh, a reaction for five years because, well, given that the um, uh, given that the, the SNP is is starting to experience that right now, given all of the financial problems and the fact that there's a, a, a distinct lack of trust, and so I'm, I'm sure that their coffers are even, you know, very very low at this point and not filling up. Yes, I saw somebody sent me something saying, if you think 96,000 is low, it's now minus 125,000. Now, I don't know if that's true because I haven't seen the accounts just now. I mean, I understand they're about to present accounts this weekend. I also heard in the grapevine that the magic 593,000 pounds will reappear in them. Is it real money? Uh, no, it's not. Is it in a bank account earning interest? As it should be, because it's meant to be ring fenced. So where is it? Where's the separate bank account with the £593,000 in it earning interest? No, no, it doesn't exist. You've spent it. This is an illusion. It's future spending commitment, if indeed that is what they're about to do. And it will fool nobody. Actually, all, the, all they're doing is making, I would have thought, much worse going forward that people, less and less people will trust them. People will either leave the party or they'll just stop funding or they'll not donate anymore. So unless you're just honest with people, um, you're, you're making the situation worse. Mm -hmm. I, somebody was talking about, I saw it and I've commented it online, social media today, and they were going on about in London. I don't know if you're aware of uh, the Daniel Morgan murder case. Oh, I, I heard something about it. Oh, well, it, it's, it's some guy. Well, I, I think I, yeah, it, it showed there was a report on it. Uh, yeah. Pretty Patel, pretty Patel didn't want to release it. it yeah. Was, oh, oh, but that, this is just the latest in 25 years of okay, okay. cover up. I, I, I know very little about the case. I, well, I, I know a bit about it. I followed he, he was it murdered in police. He was murdered in police custody, right? No, 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 no. But uh, but the murder was never properly investigated. And then there was police corruption and all sorts of things. Uh, went on, and uh, now the report is finally. It tied in with Rupert. Yes, Bird yes. Newspaper, world. yes. News International was directly linked with all this. Yeah. Um, so it was a dirty, uh, murky game, uh, but again, it wasn't I mean, bad enough what actually happened. But it's the fact that for twenty odd years it's been covered up, and they've never got the truth. Um, and it's finally the truth has now been published. It's very damning. But this is my point. Um, the same thing is be, was uh, being said there, which is, oh, they should uh, kick out the Metropolitan Police um, leader, you know. And you think, well, first of all, she wasn't in charge when this happened. But as I pointed out in my reply, this is the danger all large organizations and management in big organizations sometimes end up with a scandal and weak leadership and weak management will try and cover it up and hide it. Mm. Strong management, strong leadership 
accepts that there's a problem, puts their hands up, uh, agrees to launch a full investigation and then act on the results. Mm. And we've not had that in this situation with the money with the SNP. We've not had hands up, we spent it, uh, okay, we maybe shouldn't have, um, but this is what we're going to do to fix it. Instead, we just had uh, cover up and claims that it's woven in accounts and <laughs> there's not there's no money missing. Well, where is it then? Mm -hmm. Oh, you won't get a straight answer. The result of that is people won't trust you ever again to give you money. Mm -hmm. So you're you're making it worse. Just own up, fix it, move move on, act on the results, put in transparency. Everybody would then be happy. But it happens in all sorts of organisations. It's not just political parties. Um, and I've heard of people who have had been in the civil servant and service and there was some dodgy things going on or problems and a lot of the time you find management want to shut down stop people talking about it pretend it's not happening move on move the person who's the complainant out the way rather than the person who's the problem uh, you hear about this all the time it's everywhere it's in every organization mm -hmm. You need strong leadership, strong management. And, and do you have any theories or information on where the money actually did go? No, they won't tell anyone where it went. The idea that it's interwoven in the accounts. I got asked that um, recently. I knew it wasn't true because being a branch officer of a branch for seven years, every month we had a report. So we knew exactly how much was in our bank accounts. What they were claiming is that they had taken this £590,000 and it was woven in our accounting unit. This is, that's what they mean by that is 290 approximately branch and constituency accounts. Well, I don't know about you, but that would be money laundering. So that would be illegal. Second, why would you want to take £593,000 and split it between 290 accounts, if that's what you're claiming you did with it? Because you wouldn't get very much interest if you did that. So, of course, you would want to keep it in an interest-bearing account. And the other reason I knew it was what they were claiming was all untrue was that accounts, I read the accounts, I went on, found an online bank account interest calculator, put in £593,000, clicked a button to find out how much Santander would give you if you had that much money uh, on an instant uh, savers account, mm -hmm. right? And it's only it's only a fifth of a percent of interest a year they'll pay you for these accounts. It is dreadful. Wouldn't I, it be I great? I, can I say? Wouldn't it be great if we were an independent country and we had our own currency and our own central bank? Because we would be leaving interest rates at zero percent, uh, which flooding the stock market uh, and infl inflating uh, asset values. Instead, we might actually give some savers some interest on their savings because. Right. It's been appalling what's happened since 2008. It really has. It's not a success. It's great if you've got a massive mortgage, then you pay very little in interest for it. But if you're a pensioner or, or you've been smart and you've saved money, you're actually losing money year on year with inflation. Your money is worth less than it was last year or the year before or the year before. So, again, another reason to be out of sterling and into our own currency with our own central bank and our own interest rate. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to go through a few more of the questions. Uh, tying into that, are the SNP under the current leadership now de facto the party of devolution and not independence, or have they become a unionist party? Or how do you uh, how do you, how do you view it? I I think they're a party of let's not rock the boat too much. So I'm not sure what they're a party of anymore, because it's quite clear they don't really want to deliver independence. And I say that <clears throat> regretfully, since I spent seven years in it, donated quite a lot of money, spent a hell of a lot of effort and time helping them win elections locally. But there's no sign that they're serious about independence anymore. Devolution, yes, maybe they're happy just to administer what's given to them. Mm. That's not why we voted for them, though. Mm. See, so... <clears throat> I, I, okay, I, I guess we're sort of going back to the same side. Why do you think the uh, why do you think the missing money is taking so long to be clarified? I guess because it's not there. I think that's <laughs> <clears throat> because the accounts are quite complex, and most people don't want to spend lots of time reading complex documents. And not many people 
are as pig-headed and determined as me, mm -hmm. um, who will not be palmed off with some uh, half-baked uh, response and will come back and keep asking the same question. Uh, and when they get an answer, I go, no, but that can't be. And we'll come back and say, no, you still haven't answered the question. Uh, and I'm not dissuaded uh, easily. So I think it's, and it's not just me, there's been other people have, have been asking the same questions. But I think uh, far too many people have been, oh, well, they've said it's all okay. We don't know what, we, who are we to question it? Well, I can read a set of accounts. Mm -hmm. And when you read the accounts, where's the 593,000 pounds? It should be in the accounts somewhere. Probably high, if it's meant to be ring fenced, as they promised, it would be ring fenced. It would be detailed separately in the accounts. These are ring fenced. It's in a separate account, earning interest. Only it was nowhere to be seen. And when people questioned it, they were told a load of nonsense. Okay. So why is it taking so long? Well, <laughs> I tell you, I only knew that there was something wrong last August because the in-house solicitor for the SMP in a phone call to me told me the party had financial problems. That was the 7th of August last year. And I remember thinking, since when? How can it have financial problems? That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me digging and getting the accounts and downloading them and reading them and questioning them. Uh, where's the money that I gave then? Where did that go? Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, tying in a little bit, uh, Lordy, Lordy, is this the discussion we're losing the plot? I don't know exactly what she means, but in other words, are we doing a dis I guess she means are we doing a disservice to independence by talking about this type of thing? The truth matters, and uh, I don't think so, actually. I think uh, by having a grown-up conversation and realizing that we need to all be working for independence, uh, perhaps being involved in politics is, 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 in fact, the thing that's doing it all a disservice. I think many people thought that independence, when, when, you've got to remember, Alex Salmond is the one that delivered an independence referendum in 2014. He was the leader. You know, he, he made a, a commitment in 2011, I understand. It's before I ever voted for them. So I didn't pay much attention in 2011. When, when, did you um, the, when did you join the SNP? Was it after the 20th? The after the referendum. Okay. 2.38 2 in the afternoon. Live on, was watching live on TV, Alex Salmond resigning saying he's resigning, and that's, I thought, so I joined. Uh, and then I remember thinking afterwards, my God, what have I done? Um, knew nothing about them. Uh, I've enjoyed, I enjoyed the, the first couple of years. Um, I have to say, at least the last year has not been pleasant, it's not been a nice place to be. It doesn't follow the rules that I believed it was it set up. There's been lots of things going on. Uh, social media, we've got people that are in the SNP that have vested interest in gender politics going around attacking others, demanding that we stop uh, reading certain bloggers. We, they're, they're, they're the enemy. I mean, basically, it's very divisive. Uh, and not once do any of these people uh, talk about independence or how we're going to deliver it. So I think that's where the problem is. Um, so going forward, we need, to we need to all focus on independence. How are we going to deliver it? Forget political parties. Yeah, well, I th that ties in perfectly. Uh, when do you see the movement force action for independence? And, 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 and it's the movement who have lost the feet on the ground, not the SNP. Uh, is it the movement that lost? Well, I'm not, not, you get the idea. Um, I think, uh, you know, I thought the interesting thing is, and I was against it at the beginning, I didn't think marches made any difference. And then I went on, I think the one in Sterling, and then I went on the one in Edinburgh, you know, Did the you, one that was 100,000 people yeah, that was, that was and for bloody hours before we could even move. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking, wow. Uh, and, and I think it lifted everyone's spirits and it gave it. But you need a focus as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, the politicians should have been fully supporting that and helping it move. And some of them did. I remember seeing Joanna Cherry making speeches, Dr. Philippa, uh, I think uh, Tommy Shepherd did as well. So there was politicians there as well. They all need to club together and and uh, start working on the plan of how do we deliver this and deliver it as fast as possible. The damage that's being caused 
And I think by the autumn, we'll see how much damage Brexit is really delivering. Um, I think, it's, I just find it really annoying that nobody was working hard behind the scenes to make sure we were ready for every outcome. You know, I think when, uh, if it had been me, this is just me and I'm not a politician. Um, so of course people may disagree with me, but I saw our polling at 58%. I think it was last autumn, late summer, autumn, 58% yes in the poll, the poll's going up and up. And I thought, yeah, but Brexit's coming. Then they launched the internal market bill. That is the moment, if I had been a leader, I would have called an independence referendum immediately, mm -hmm. given them three months, put the piece of legislation through, rubber stamped it, yes, we're having it. And I would have been ready with a get out on the campaign trail, uh, mm -hmm. keep night and day telling people what we're going to do because the 1st of all, J January was coming, Brexit was going to come through, which is exactly what happened, and you'll all be out and you're going to be much worse off. The other thing I think, uh, a perfect lesson, Brexit. So Brexit's one big problem. COVID-19 also proves why you need a border. You need control over your border. And you need the powers, the economic powers to get out. Um, of you only need the powers and economic powers. You need to have... Um, the strength of character to stand there and say, we're closing all borders and airports immediately. Not, we're going to close it tomorrow at midnight and then watch on TV hundreds of thousands of people running to the stations to jump on trains to get out, out of central London, which is what happened last year. And you're thinking, oh my God. Uh, I mean, it's like watching a zombie movie. It really was thinking, so we know they're coming. So we're gonna, we're gonna give them 12 hours notice before we shut the gates. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'd want you to shut the gates immediately. Not give people 12 hours notice. What happened? That was the, the, the Kent variant of COVID. And within a week, it was on the Isle of Arran. How do you think it got to the Isle of Arran from Croydon? <laughs> oh my God. I mean, do we really need to draw a map here? Mm. And now we've got another variant, the Indian variant. Mm. Um, and we're now wondering about now. I don't know about you, but all, all, going about on about COVID, wearing masks, etc. I've had the jab. I'm pretty certain a year ago in in March I had COVID. I was pretty unwell for a good three weeks, um, and uh, a lot of breathing problems and stuff. Anyway, that cleared up, and I'm fine. I've had my first jab in that, and I've been fine since. However. The vaccine is not a cure. It doesn't kill the virus. All it does is prevent hospitalization, severe illness, and hopefully death mm -hmm. from COVID. Mm -hmm. That's what the vaccine does. Politicians need to understand. It doesn't stop you getting infected. It doesn't stop you spreading the new variant to other people. There is a drug. It's all, this is all available for if people bother to research it. There's a drug being tested in Australia. It's about two years away. It kills the virus. It doesn't just vaccinate you against the nasty reactions of your immune system. It kills the virus. And it's about two years away. So until that is available everywhere and has been fully tested and is rolled out and everyone's had that injection, you're not going to get rid of this COVID-19. It's just going to keep mutating, keep infecting people. We're, ended, we're going to end up with more lockdowns, more damage to people's business, more jobs lost. So, independent country with a border with England is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means you control and you can stop this sort of thing happening again. If, if anything can be learned from New Zealand, they closed their borders, they shut the airports and stopped people getting in and they, they um, uh, tested and traced. And they virtually had no examples of it at all. Okay. And people say, oh, well, they're an island. Uh, hello, Britain's an island as well. But this island kept Heathrow open throughout. 18 million people came from all over the world during our lockdown, got on the London Underground and travelled wherever they liked. And we wonder why we haven't got it under control and we've got yet another variant. Well, you don't have to be very clever to work this out you have to be able to shut down travel and stop it being transmitted. And the vaccine is great. It prevents serious illness. It present, prevents hospitalization and death from COVID. It doesn't prevent the spread 
uh, of the virus. And if the virus keeps mutating, which it does, it's part of the infection process. It, it, it takes bits of your DNA in the host, i.e. the human, and it mutates uh, and copies it. And that's the danger that we're not out, we're not out of danger here. And this is why it annoys me even more to hear people talking in politics about we can't afford to have Indirect 2 until we've recovered from COVID. My God, that could be 10, 15 years from now. I also saw in a recent SNP one of the, until we rebuilt after COVID. I mean, you know, what is that? 15? And how long is that? And how are we going to rebuild if all the purse strings are held by Westminster? Yeah. Hello, people. Hello. Scotland independence that's, that's, that's comes first. <laughs> it okay. comes first because that's how you rebuild your economy. It's the other way around. Once you've got full control over your borders, my, my God, we could use the same script they used for the Brexiteers. Just take, just take Nigel Farage's script and replace Britain with Scotland, you know, and there you go. You've got the perfect campaign. <laughs> Okay, uh, why should the SNP be the only party that can get us independence? Uh, well, I, uh, in my view, uh, they're not in a good sh shape to do that right now. And it, it can't, I don't think it can be, there is no other political party. It has to be the movement itself that, that, uh, that, that, that delivers it through things like what we're doing and, and just uh, you know, hammering away. I, 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 I think what needs to happen now is uh, every yes supporter needs to write to their politician, whoever they are, and demand that they declare their support for, for independence as soon as practically possible. That's how you do it. Uh, and if they don't sign up to it, don't vote for them again. Yeah. It's that okay. simple. Um, if, forget, poli forget party politics, forget policy, forget the parties. Forget that there is an SNP or an ALBA or ISP or the Tory. Forget the names and the brands. It's about your politician uh, supporting Scotland's best interest. Best interest is, of course, independence. It has to be. So you've got control over your own fiscal policy and your own economy. Um, and it's more than that. You know, I was saying this to somebody the other day. Do you know, independence is not about even the economy. It's not. It's about a very simple thing, which is you vote for people who will represent you, who live in your community. You do not have uh, your politicians 400 miles away um, and you've only got 59 out of the 600 and 533 of them represent England and 59 represent Scotland. And what, you think it's going to be fair and even and balanced? Of course it's not. Um, so, of course, uh, that's the difference. The difference is you're voting for uh, a system where your community is represented by people that live much closer to you. And so therefore more likely to understand your needs and issues, not 400 miles away. Okay. Let me uh, just get a couple more in and I'll let you, I'll let you finish off. Uh, what is, what's the stopping us getting the Nordic trade agreement? Uh, that the, the Tories have uh, the, the, now what we were what we've found out is that the that Scotland could easily join the Nordic Council in observer status, which means that they could we and they, and they could do, the, the, the Scottish uh, uh, Parliament could do that tomorrow. All they have to do uh, is, is 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 sign a resolution, adopt a resolution asking the Nordic Council can we the observer status. We're in. That's not the same as a full member, and it's not the same as uh, a, tra a free trade agreement. Uh, if now Scotland can join EFTA as long as it has the power to sign international treaties and the powers to abide by them. And in my view, if, if the Scotland, you know, the Scottish government or parliament government just said, look, we're, we're passing these laws, we don't care, we're going to sign the agreement with EFTA and we're going to pass the laws to do it and just start, you got to start somewhere, you know, in, in, in yeah. my view. So I think that that is so um, just to distinguish between EFTA and the Nordic and, and, uh, and but it, once you're in, they're in the Nordic, um, the, the, the uh, Nordic Council is more of a, co a regional cooperation group and they have, uh, and they have member states that are, you know, the big, you know, Norway, Iceland, uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, et cetera. Uh, they're, they're the full members. I'm not sure which all of them are, probably Finland and I think Estonia. 
think the Baltics are. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, but but any any group or not even state, any group that's up there, you know, uh, including indigenous peoples can become observer status. So they could do that tomorrow. But that's not the same as a free trade agreement. Very quickly about the digital covenant. Why doesn't no one doesn't anyone talk about it anymore? As someone who worked very closely on that, it was largely it did fall victim a lot to the COVID uh, because it was intended to be a very grassroots thing where we would have long marches and, you know, get lots of uh, people and, you know, talk to people in communities and to get people to sign it. The COVID really shut that down. And so uh, whether it would have worked or not in, in absence, uh, you know, in absence of the, of, of the COVID, I don't know, but um, I'm as disappointed as anybody. I, I, th I think going forward, I think the, the independence movement um, maybe he's had a wake-up call. Uh, I, I don't get the impression that people are less enthusiastic about no. delivering independence. No, no I, don't, I, don't I, I get the feeling quite the opposite. They're now getting increasingly frustrated with a particular party for not moving. So I, th I think the parties are a couple of years behind the feeling of the people. Um, what I think needs to happen now is all the different yes, groups need to start pulling together so maybe we need a summer of not a summer of love, but a summer of independence, where we uh, start meeting up and uh, having uh, our own stalls, perhaps the marches, since we're now allowed to move around a bit more, um, and just start uh, debating what the different uh, options are. I think that's what's needed. I mean, I was going to bring this up, right? I won't show my address on it, but I got that quite recently. From good old Nicola, in the Indiref too. It's in the post. When? I'd like to know when. When is it? You, you know, you got my first vote. My second vote actually went to Alba. Um, where, where, where is it? There's no sign of it. Um, I've given up buying the national newspaper for its endless front pages. Indiref, it's just round the corner. Indiref, it's 2020. Indiref, that's one more mandate. Does anyone believe it anymore? I don't. I don't believe a word of it. Um, so I, I, I hope everyone will pull together and start actually being, um, well, progressing, progressing the arguments, uh, working out what sort of Scotland do we want? How do we get, how do we fix all the things that Brexit is breaking? I think we need to do that. And then I, the other thing I want to round off before, before we end is there is a petition that's been launched, and I don't know who put it up there, but it's for the UK government to answer, not the Scottish one. And it's um, a petition for devolving powers over broadcasting, for the regulation of broadcasting. Because I think Scotland is underserved when it comes to broadcasting, quite clearly. As you know, Mark, I've got a pet project and working away behind the scenes on that, and hopefully that will bear fruit. But... Um, it's quite clear that we need to start just start taking control of our, our own destiny and stop sitting around thinking we have to put up with all this. No, we don't. And I think Brexit's shown that we were right. We should have stayed. We should have remained, you know? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, anything else you'd like to, uh, maybe, maybe a positive note here at the end? Uh, to, um... Well, the, the, the positive thing is uh, the truth is very... Um, freeing it's good to, to to know the truth and to, to speak about it um and i think uh the party that i've just left not that long ago will be in a much better state when it's prepared to debate freely and start focusing because i'm not quite sure what's been holding them back but start focusing on how are we going to fix all this how are we going to deliver independence how, tell the public we need to have our own currency tell them what the advantages are Tell them why we need to have a border. Lots of countries have borders. Hopefully our border will be similar to Switzerland because um, I've, I've had to use that in the past with goods. And while it's a pain <coughs> in the butt for moving goods, there's no issues at all with people. You know, okay, you can sometimes have to show them your passport as you drive through. Most of the time they don't bother. Um, it's only when you're taking goods across the border that you've got to have um, done some work. So I think we, we shouldn't be afraid of this. Uh, not only that, having a border means you've created some jobs. So there's border border guards needed. I, I remember Labour, Labour's um, Ed Miliband going on about he was going to put guards on the border. I went, oh, good job creation. Um, <laughs> he obviously wanted it to be very negative, 
I thought, oh, excellent, more jobs. How many jobs will that create? Um, so let's let's not be afraid of the discussions, um, and let's 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 point out all the benefits of being in control of your own economy, your own policies, your own borders, um, your own culture. We can have our own me- uh, te- television channels, our own media. We can have our own uh, Gaelic version of EastEnders. Imagine that, good God. Um, well, that, 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 uh, the East Ender accent. In- oh my God! Yeah, oh, yeah. My Lord. Any, 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 but uh, but in Gaelic. But anyway, um, yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't watch any of that anymore. Um, but yes, of course, we can do things. Uh, we just have to. If other small countries can do it, you know, Ireland has less population than Scotland. They have two television channels, but they have four. But two RTEs. They make their own daily soaps. They make their own shows. Well, why don't we do that? Let's do it. Okay. On that note, uh, thank you everybody for watching once again. And uh, we, um, we hope to have, um, uh, we're working to have a, a much more revamped, branded uh, version of uh, building the Scottish state coming in the next few weeks. So stay tuned, but uh, we'll get a little improvement on the technology and the scenery and, uh, and be more, t- and hopefully be more targeted in uh, focusing much more on actually what uh, you know, building the Scottish state in terms of getting ex- experts to talk about different areas, whether it be currency, all of these things that we're talking about. So uh, I hope that that should be emerging in the next couple of weeks. So please stay tuned. And thanks again, uh, David, for being with us. Thanks for having me.